Hi guys and welcome back to the graduation project for the final day of the 30 days of Python series. Today, as you will have read already, we're building the snake game using Pygame. If you haven't checked out the Pygame preparation blog post that we've got, then I definitely recommend you do so, as we're going to cover how to use Pygame in there. In this video, we're only going to cover how to build the snake game using Pygame. If we start to go into how to actually use Pygame, this is going to get really, really long. So for today's project, we're building the snake game. And if you're not familiar with the game, well, which hole have you been hiding in, first of all? But we're going to be playing as a snake that is trying to gather up little pieces of food. Every time the snake's head passes through a square containing food, we get a point and the snake also grows by a certain amount. If the snake hits its own body or the walls of the play area, then the snake dies, the game ends. We're going to control the snake with our keyboard keys. The arrow keys make a lot of sense for this, so we're going to use those, but you're going to be able to choose whichever keys you want. Every time a piece of food appears, it's going to appear in a random location on the screen, not within the snake's body, so that we don't miss it accidentally. But here we are, I have created app.py, where most of my snake game code is going to go, and I have installed Pygame using pip. As discussed in the Pygame preparation blog post, we've got some boilerplate or standard setup code that we're going to use for this project. And that setup includes importing Pygame, then we'd also want to create a window. And in order to do that, we need to specify the window height, which is going to be 840, the window width, which is going to be 800. And I'm also going to create another constant for window dimensions, which is a tuple of window width and window height. Then we're going to initialize Pygame. This does a bunch of setup behind the scenes. We don't really have to worry about it, but essentially it's necessary to start using Pygame. And we're going to do pygame.display.setCaption with the snake, and that is going to set the title of the window we create. Finally, in order to run really any game, we need a clock. So we're going to do clock equal pygame.time.clock, and that is going to create essentially a timer that allows us to redraw the screen every certain amount of time. Essentially allows us to measure the ticks of time in between two frames of our game being drawn. We're going to get into more detail in just a moment. Then we, of course, also need a screen or some place to actually draw stuff. So we're going to do screen equal pygame.display.set mode, and we're going to get the window dimensions, which is the tuple. Then we'll do a function called play game. This is essentially an infinite loop that runs for as long as we don't tell pygame to shut down. And so while true, and then here we're simply going to cycle through the events in Pygame. And so we'll do in pygame.event.get. This gets all the events currently queued up in our uh, Pygame application. And if the event type is equal to pygame.quit, then we are going to return exiting the function. Otherwise, outside the for loop, we're going to do clock.tick on 30 seconds. Then we're going to do play game. What this is going to do is simply run infinitely, and every time we run, we tick the clock. That means that we advance, essentially, in time. Anything that is waiting for a timer or anything that's going to happen in the next tick or any event that gets thrown out while we are waiting for the next tick will get processed in this loop. So this is essentially what keeps the game going. All right, so let's save this and run it. We're going to run it. You can do Command J or Control J if you're on Windows and open up the terminal. And then here, as long as you are in the environment that has Pygame installed, you can do Python app.py. And then you can see we get our window there. We're also going to define a second file called colors.py. And in here, we're just going to create a few colors that we're going to use in our application. So we'll do from collections import named tuple. We're going to create a color named tuple. Notice that I'm using the British spelling here since that's where I am living. And we're going to have R, G, and B. Notice that colors are using red, green, and blue. And this is all detailed in our Pygame preparation blog post that you can read. It's linked down below. Then I've created four different colors. One for the background, snake, food, and the text that we're going to be showing. So I'll save this, go back to app.py, and here we're going to import it. So we'll do import colors, 
and then in here we're going to draw that color in the screen. So we'll do screen dot fill colors dot background. Now if we do this, we'll see that when we run the application again, nothing really changes. Also, it helps if we spell things correctly. And so we'll see nothing really changes. The screen is still black. And that is because we haven't told the screen to actually update with the new thing that we have drawn in it. So we do have to do pygame.display.update. Now the screen is this dark blue. Notice that I put the fill here inside the loop. And that's because if we draw other things on top of the fill color, we want to cover it up with the next fill color when we run the loop again. So here we're going to be essentially redrawing everything in our application every time this loop runs and then covering it up with the old color for the background. Then we're going to be drawing again all the other things like the snake and the food and so forth, covering it back up with the background color and so on every time. At this point, we can stop and think about how we're actually going to implement some of the logic here for the snake to move. How, how is it going to move? How is the food going to appear? You know, all that sort of stuff. I think a good approach would be to keep track of the position of various snake segments, since we can use those positions to draw the squares that are going to make up the snake's body. So the snake is going to be a collection of little squares, and those squares are going to look like they're moving across the screen. In order to be able to draw each square, we need a position for each square. Whenever we move the squares, what we're going to do is we're going to grab the last square of the snake and move it to the front, basically. So here in our function, we're going to start off by creating the snake positions. And this is going to be a list of tuples where each tuple is a position for a square to be drawn. So we're going to start at 100, 100, 80 and 100 and 60 and 100. We're also going to put here the food position, which is where we're going to draw the food square. And that's going to be 160, 160 to begin with. We're going to randomize this later on. But for now, this looks like a pretty decent starting position, a snake of three squares, this one, that one, and this one, and the food position, which is going to be here. Notice that I'm defining the squares to be 20 pixels wide by 20 pixels tall. And uh, since we are defining the positions as being separated by 20 pixels. So this square here is 20 pixels separated from this one, which means that my squares are going to be 20 pixels in size. All right, so let's take these positions and actually draw them on the screen with another function. So we'll do draw objects and I'm going to take the snake positions and the food position and we're going to draw these. So we'll do pygame.draw.rect on the screen that we've got out here. So we're going to draw on that screen the food, colors.food, and we're going to put the food position. And then we also need to pass in the size, so the width and height of the food. And this is going to be 20 and 20. So at this point, I'm going to open up my terminal and run this again and see what happens. You can see we get nothing because we haven't called the draw objects function. So we should do that. After calling screen.fill, we're going to call draw objects with the snake positions, which are at the moment unused, and the food position as well. Now we'll run this again. You can see we've got a nice little food there. Obviously, it doesn't move and the snake doesn't appear yet because what we've done here is we have drawn on the screen using this color, this position, and this size. So essentially, this tells uh, Pygame to draw a rectangle with this color. That we know is the food, but Pygame doesn't really care what it is. It just knows that it's a rectangle. What we have to do next is draw the snake rectangles. So we'll do four X and Y in snake positions. Notice that snake positions is a list of tuples. So X and Y are mapping to each of these in here. And we'll do pygame.draw.rect on the screen with the colors of the snake, the x, y, and 20, 20. Notice that here we passed in two tuples, food position and 20, 20. Here we're passing four separate elements in the list, and that's totally fine. We can do either or two tuples or just four values, and Pygame will understand what we mean. So we're going to run this again. And now you can see we've got our snake here that occupies three squares and our food. Notice that the head of the snake is this square here at 100, 100. 
This is 8100 and this is 6100. So the closer we get to the top left, the closer we get into 0, 0. The food here is at 160, 160. What we're going to do in order to move the snake is we're going to grab the last square and we're going to move it to the front, essentially. All right. Notice that we are using 20 here quite often. So we're going to create a constant for that. We're going to call it segment size and that's going to be 20. And we're going to use that throughout the whole thing. At the moment, the food position is always the same, and obviously we don't want to do that. So let's create another function that will allow us to randomize this food position. Something that's going to be important when we're defining this function is we don't want the new food to appear on top of the snake. So we're going to have to do some work there to prevent that. So I'm going to define a function set new food position that takes in the snake positions and it's going to essentially try to randomize a food position then check if that random position is on the snake. And if it is, it's just going to try again. Very simple approach, quite a naive approach, but we're kind of hoping that throughout trying to create a new position, it's not going to collide with the snake positions all that often. So just by doing randomly, hopefully we don't have to try too many times. So we'll say while true, and we'll create a random X position, which is going to be rand int uh, from 0 to 39 times the segment size. Now I'm going to import rand int, so we will do from random import rand int at the top. And this is going to generate a random number between 0 and 39. And then we're going to multiply that number by the segment size. Notice that we're going to want the X position to stay within the bounds of our application, so we can only reach up to 800. 39 times 20 is going to be 780. And remember, the square that we're going to be drawing is 20 pixels wide, so that brings us to 800. Similarly, for the Y position, we're going to do rand int from 2 to 41. And the reason we're doing 2 here is because we're going to have a small unplayable area at the top of our game to display the score. So we're going to leave a wee gap there for that. Again, 41 takes us to 820, and the thing is 20 pixels high, so it's going to go to 840. Finally, we are going to say food position is equal to x position and y position. And then we're simply going to do if food position is not in snake positions, then we will return it. And otherwise, we'll just repeat the loop again and generate a new one and then check again and again and again until it so happens that the randomly generated food position is not on top of the snake. Hopefully this happens quite early on. Like I said earlier, this is not a particularly efficient way of doing it, but it is very simple. So now down here, instead of 160, 160, we'll simply do set new food position and we pass in the snake positions that we have right now. And then we can press play. And we can see that the food does appear to be in a different place. And it should happen every time. Next, we're going to tackle the score, since this is quite an easy step. Remember, we've discussed how to display text in our Pygame preparation post that you can read. It's linked in the description below. And the only thing we have to do is add a starting score variable to the play game function. And then we need to render the text that shows it. So initially, the score is going to be zero, of course. And then what we're going to do down here after we draw the objects is we're going to uh, grab a font. We'll do pygame.font.com font and that creates a new font none that's the uh, file where the font lives if we use none that's just going to use a default font and here we're going to set a size of 28 and then we'll do text equal font dot render and we will create the string that we want to potentially display and we'll say score is the current score true for whether we want it anti-aliased or not anti-aliasing is always going to look a bit better of course especially in higher resolution screens and the color, which is going to be colors.text. Now, this does produce the text that we can then display on the screen, but we actually have to display it separately. So we'll do screen.blit and we'll pass in the text, and the position is going to be 10, 10. All right, let's run this and see what happens. You can see we've got score zero there. Now, we want the food to disappear and the score to increase when the snake collides with it. But of course, that's not going to happen unless we can actually move the snake. So let's handle that next. I'm going to create a new function here and we're going to call it move snake. It's going to take the snake positions and it's also going to take a direction. The direction is going to be, you know, where the snake is going to up, left, down or right. Then we're going to get the head position. So head X position 
and head Y position is going to be the snake positions zero. This is the first element in this list. So at the moment it would be 100, 100. Then we'll have a long if statement for each direction. I'll just code one with you here. If the direction is left, then the new head position is going to be this one, but we're going to get closer to the left. So we'll do head X minus the segment size so that this becomes essentially 80, 100, the snake moving to the left. And of course, we want the same Y position because when we're moving left, we're not altering the Y position. So we're going to do something like this for every different direction. Let me just show you real quick what I mean. All right, so I've coded these if statements here. If the direction is right, we're doing the same thing by adding the segment size so that we continue moving to the right. Then if the direction is down, we're changing only the Y position, increasing it. And if the direction is up, again, decreasing it, moving us closer to the top left. Then what we'll do is we'll modify the snake positions. We will make this the new first element and we will delete the last one. For example, let's say that our snake is moving to the right. And the next element should be 120, 100. So what we want to do is we want to add essentially here 120, 100. And we want to delete 60, 100. And what we end up with is the same three elements as before, therefore a size three snake. But now the positions are more towards the right. All of the squares seem to have moved, but really all we've done is we have uh, created a new head and removed the last element. So I'll revert those changes here. And in the function, we're going to do snake positions dot insert on index zero. So at the very start, a new head position. And we're also going to delete snake positions minus one, which is going to give us the very last one. This deletes the very last element in the list. Of course, in order to call this function, we do need a direction. So we're just going to set a current direction string here, current direction to be equal to right. And we are going to use that when we're calculating the movement of the snake. Something important to note is that we want to move the snake after we draw. Otherwise, the snake's position initially would be essentially already moved before we draw. So we're going to update the display and then we're going to do move snake with snake positions and current direction. Let's run this and see what happens. Hey, I can't move it. So it just disappeared there. There's a bunch of stuff we have to do still. So we have to die if we hit the size and we also have to, of course, be able to control the snake. So let's start tackling those. To let the user control the snake, we have to do a couple of things. We need to listen for the key press event so that we can see what keys the user is pressing. And once we have a hold of the key, we have to figure out what it actually means. So whether that's up, down, left or right. The first thing to do is here in the events, we're going to do elif event.type is equal to pygame.key down. And that's going to tell us when the user pressed a key. Then we're going to change the current direction to be some on key press function that we're going to define with the event and the current direction. What we're going to do in this function is we're going to essentially return a string representing the new direction. But we also want to make sure that we can't change direction uh, essentially 180 degrees. So we don't want to be able to go left when we're going right. That would essentially make the snake turn onto itself. And we're not going to allow that to happen. Something important to note is that the event here has a number and that number represents a key. And so we do need a key map that I'm going to put up here with my constants. And this means that if the number in the event is 273, that means they press the up arrow. If it's 274, that means they press the down arrow and so on. Notice that I'm mapping these exactly to the directions that we want to use in our if statement. That's just so that we can simplify our job later on down the line. Now let's go ahead and create the on key press function. So we'll do on key press and we're going to get an event and the current direction. And here what we're going to do is first of all, grab the key code. So the 273, 274, etc. That we're going to grab with event dot underscore underscore dict underscore underscore. And then we're going to access the key property. Then the new direction variable is going to hold the string representing the direction. So that's key map dot get key. Notice that here we're going to be accessing the key map dictionary. And we're trying to see if 273, 274, 275 or 276 is something that we're retrieving from there. 
Notice that if they press anything else, for example, the letter A, this function is still going to fire, but we're not going to get a valid key from this key map. Instead, doing dot get of the key is going to give us none. And so therefore, we are going to ignore everything if this is none rather than a valid key. Now, here we've got all the directions that we can accept, and that is going to be up, down, left, and right, making sure to close all our strings. And this is going to be helpful so that we can check whether this is one of them. Now, we also want the opposites. And here I'm going to define a tuple of sets, and that is up and down, and left and right. The reason I'm doing this is because we're going to now be able to check whether the current direction and the new direction are, in fact, equal to one of these sets. And if they are, we know that we're trying to move in the opposite direction to which we're currently going, and we don't want to allow that. So, here comes our if statement. If the new direction is in all directions, that means that we were able to retrieve a valid direction from the key map, which means that the user did indeed press one of the four arrow keys. But we also want to make sure that the new direction and the current direction are not opposites. So what we're going to do is we're going to build here a set of new direction, current direction, and we're going to make sure it's not in the opposites tuple. So if new direction is a valid direction and new direction and current direction as a set are not equal to one of these, then we can continue and we can return the new direction as a valid string. Otherwise, we can simply return current direction, meaning we won't have changed the direction. Now, a common question might be, well, why does this work? You know, what if the current direction is down and the new direction is up? This would be down, up. Down, up is not here, right? Because this is up, down. But important that these things here are sets. Sets don't have order. So actually, down, up, and up, down are the same thing when we're talking about sets. So that is how that works. Notice I put the brackets around here so that we can a bit more easily split this into multiple lines if you want. That's totally up to you. Normally, you would split here in the and, so it's a bit clearer that this is a condition for the if statement. All right, let's try this out. I'll open the terminal and run this. And you can see that I am going very fast, um, but it does seem to work. And if I try to go in the opposite direction, it doesn't let me. Notice, of course, that I can eat this food barely sometimes, um, but yeah, it doesn't work. So we still need to fix that, and we also need to fix the collisions with the walls. So let's check for the collisions first. Let's create another function, check collisions. And that is given the snake positions. And what we're going to do again is grab the head. Because really the head is the part we're most interested in. If the head collides, the rest is going to collide as well. So here we're going to return whether the head X position has hit either wall. So that is in minus 20 for the left wall. Or window width for the right wall. Or the head Y position is in 20 for the top or window height for the bottom. Finally, we also want to check whether the snake has collided with itself. So we'll do head X and Y in snake positions, but make sure to omit the first snake position. Otherwise, it will always be the case because the head is part of the snake. So we do want to check against only snake starting from the second position onwards. This should return true or false. If it returns true, that means that one of these was true. And that means that we did, in fact, collide against something. And what we want to do in that case is terminate the game. So for now, we'll go down here below move snake and we'll do if check collisions snake positions, then we'll simply return for now. So we're not going to display any, you know, end screen or anything like that just now. We'll simply return. That terminates the loop, ends the game, easy peasy. So let me run this. And you can see that it terminates and the application shuts down. You're done here. Game over. And the same thing will happen if you, you know, collide against yourself and so on. The final piece of the puzzle is checking for food collisions. So we can create another function that is to check for food. So we'll do check food collision. And here it's going to take the snake positions and the food position. And it's just going to check whether we're on it. So snake positions 
0 is equal to the food position, then we will say snake positions. No, we do have we do need an if statement here. I got a bit too excited there. Dot append snake positions minus one. What this is going to do is it's going to essentially add to the snake the same element that it currently has at the end, essentially ending up like this if the head hits the food. Why do we do this? Why do we want two squares drawn one on top of another? Well, the reason is we're going to check for food collisions before we move the snake the next time. And when we move the snake, we're actually going to get rid of one of these and we're going to add a new head. But when we eat the food, we want the snake to grow. So by having two duplicates at the end, we will remove one of them and add a new head like this. But as you can see, now we have four elements of the snake. One of them is in the same position as it was before at the end, and we essentially have a new head. So that is why we're wanting to do this. Then we'll also return true if we did collide, and we'll return none if we didn't collide, but that's the default for every Python function. Now we can go down here and say if we check food collision and it does collide, snake positions and food position. Notice that earlier I said that we're going to check food positions before moving the snake. It doesn't matter whether you put it at the front or at the back. In either case, we're checking food collisions before we move the snake in the next round. So either case works. We're going to do food position equal set new food position with the current snake positions. And we'll do score plus equal one. Notice that we increase the score here and then we'll re-render it the next iteration of the loop. So that's going to change the text on our screen. Let's run this and see what happens. Hey, I'm getting pretty good at this. Ah, oh, and as I say that, I died. It's pretty fast, but you can definitely change the speed simply by changing this number here. Let's see what happens if we put 100, for example. That is much faster, so we can do 10. And now it's almost incredibly slow. Um, but yeah, it works. So there you have it. This is how you can create a snake game using Pygame. And as you can see, it's rather long, but there's nothing terribly complicated in here. All we're doing is keeping track of our different squares, moving them around and changing them as we have to. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit here so you can see the code a bit better. And here's what we've done. We've defined our constants and then we have initialized Pygame, set the window title. We've got our clock, which allows us to tick through the game or rather wait uh, for a certain amount of time before the next frame. Then we've set the window dimensions and that gives us a screen on which we can draw. We've got a few functions to draw the snake and the food. These are just rectangles with a certain color. Set a new food position, which calculates a random X and Y position for the food and checks that it's not on top of the snake. Moving the snake simply removes the last element of the snake and adds a new one at the start with the new position. On key press is the rather complicated function here that actually checks whether we've got a valid key being pressed and then it calculates that it is a valid new direction. Checking collisions against the sides of the window and the snake itself and checking against the food collisions, whether the head is equal to the food position, and then we add a new position at the end of the snake. Finally, when we play the game, we've got the score, the current direction, the current positions, and the food position, which is random. Then we start repeating forever. If the event is quit, we terminate. Otherwise, we calculate the new direction if there is a key down. We're then drawing. So we draw on top of the whole screen a background color that overrides everything we drew in the previous iteration. We then draw our snake and our food. We then draw our score and we update the display so that anything that has to be drawn here does appear. After drawing, we're moving the snake, checking against the collisions against the sides and the snake itself, and then checking against the food collision. And all of this is updating these variables up here so that we can then draw them again and update the display again. All right, that's everything in here. Remember that you can add more stuff to this project. You can add, for example, start and end screens. You can tr keep track of high scores. You can add music. The possibilities really are endless. 
I hope you enjoyed this final project in this series. Remember that we've got a few blog posts linked down in the description of this video in case you want to check sort of next steps, more things you can do with Python. We've got a few courses linked down there that you can check out. And also, I hope that you will continue coding in Python. I hope you've enjoyed this journey. Thanks for joining me for it. And I'll see you very soon.